to bear with me. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to start off very briefly by talking about the sort of challenges as well as the rewards of carrying out cross-national data analysis. Um, but I'm really going to focus primarily then on exploring two international data sets that are available to you um, now, one of which is the International Social Survey Programme, which is a global survey, and the other of which is the European Social Survey Programme, which um, obviously relates to Europe only. Um, just to kick off, though, by talking about the sort of challenges um, as well as the rewards of carrying out cross-national data analysis. The challenges are very obvious already from the, the two <coughs> speakers who preceded this. Um, as Gareth, I think, quite rightly put it, you need to make sure you're comparing apples with apples and pears with pears. You need to be really clear that the data that you're looking at is genuinely comparable in a way that isn't always the case. Um, and just a couple of points that are worth mentioning here. Lots of countries come at this sort of thing with very different traditions of survey research. So some countries, for example, have a very well-respected, long-running tradition of carrying out social surveys <coughs> that are based on random probability sampling. Other countries might have a very long tradition of doing surveys, but very much operate along the lines of a more traditional um, quota-based survey approach. Um, so if you're doing cross-national analysis, you need to be really clear that the data you're looking at has been sampled in comparable ways. Um, you need to be sure as well that the questions have been translated in a way um, that makes sense. It's all very well for people to design these perfect questions in British English, but if they're then not translated appropriately within the languages of the countries um, involved in the study, any comparisons that you make are really quite meaningless. So again, there needs to be a lot of attention paid to that. Um, and then finally, I suppose as analysts, you need to be really clear that you know the countries you're analysing. Um, I mean, a lot of the work I'm involved with, we often see a sort of league table approach where people just kind of rank all the different countries who took part um, and then say, gee, look, Sweden's at the top, Turkey's at the bottom, and the UK's always somewhere in the middle. To try and go beyond that, you need to really understand something more about the countries that you're analysing. Um, so those are the challenges. However, I think there are really clear dividends, which I should be able to illustrate now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there are really clear dividends. The first dividend is really that it allows you a way into exploring what I've called here general theories. So these are the sort of grand theories beloved of a lot of social science. Um, secularization, social trust, postmodernism. If you can look at more than one country, if you can look at trends over time, particularly across countries, you get a much better handle on trying to understand those sorts of um, issues and how they're changing over time. Cross-national research also gives you a very good handle on trying to understand relationships. So, for example, there's been a lot of work looking at um, citizens' attitudes towards welfare. You know, do people have a particularly punitive view about welfare recipients or are they more generous and sympathetic in their views towards those on welfare? And one of the, the best pieces of analysis that's been done here is tried to relate people's attitudes to the different sorts of welfare regimes that operate within different countries. And you can't do that without having high quality, comparable um, cross-national research. And then finally, there's a very clear um, benefit, I think, of if, even if you're not concentrating on cross-national research and you're only looking at one country, Knowing where that one country exists in a broader context is really helpful in trying to help you understand what is high, what is low, how is something changing over time. If you think about some of the debates going on within the UK about turnout in general elections, knowing what is happening in other similar countries, how turnout is changing over time, who votes, who doesn't vote, that gives you a very different sense of what's going on in the UK to just focusing on the UK alone. And that's why I've included the slightly mysterious quote at the bottom from Marshall McLuhan. We don't know who discovered water, but we know it wasn't the fish. And the point I'm trying to make is that if you're immersed in something and you're just in it, like the fish in water, you can't always see what makes that different. So just to pass very briefly on to the two different survey series I wanted to talk to you about now. Um, the first of them, the International Social Survey Programme, it's an annual survey that began in the mid-1980s. Um, it doesn't have any kind of central coordination, I'll, I'll come back to this as a theme later on, 
but basically each country who takes part in ISSP, they simply find the money to run the questions in their country, and that's it. There's no central funding. Um, each country who takes part, so a minimum of 1,000 interviewed within each country. Um, they're, they're strict about the mode of interview in the sense that it has to be visual, but it can be either face-to-face -face or it could be a self-completion questionnaire. Um, everyone who takes part answers 60 questions, which are in an agreed order. Um, in most countries, the questions are included as part of a bigger survey. So in the UK, for example, they're asked on the British Social Attitude Survey. Um, and there's also an agreed set of background questions. And then once people have um, carried out the survey, they then provide the data to a central archive within nine months. And this is where the core funding um, issue comes in. There's no real funding to support that archive. And as a result, they, they do a fantastic job, but it's not, it doesn't come out in a timely fashion. So the most recent data set available from ISSP is from the 2008 survey. Um, and I've given you the link at the bottom of the page. In terms of who participates in ISSP, there's nearly 50 countries across the world now. There's a really nice, um, really nice blocks of countries now, so that it used to be very dominated by the European nations, but you've now got a very respectable number of countries within South America. You're getting a growing number of um, countries from the Far East. The, the countries that are probably the most underrepresented are possibly not surprisingly from Africa and the Middle East, but elsewhere in the world there's a really good representation of countries for analysts to look at. And what most people do tend to do is focus on blocks of countries within a particular geographical region um, to avoid <coughs> getting into that sort of league table territory I mentioned earlier. In terms of topics, um, the list is there. I suppose the key point to make here is that I hope you'll see it covers many of the really key social science um, areas. And within ISSP, there's a very strong emphasis on the importance of collecting time series data. So the basic rule is that if we're repeating a module, so for example, the role of government one, the rule is that 40 of those 60 <coughs> questions have to repeat questions asked on earlier rounds of that module. So on, on three of the um, topics, role of government, social inequality, and family and change, family and change in general, you've got a fantastic time series now that spans over 20 years, although obviously only a, a quite a limited number of countries took part in the first few years of ISSP. So that's ISSP. Um, ESS is the sort of new kid on the block. Um, it's, it started in 2002 and it's taken place every two years since then. Compared to ISSP, it's very, very generous, generously funded. And that means that they can be very demanding as to what they expect from countries to participate. And they're able to give countries a lot of support in order to make sure that they can live up to that. Um, they have much more stringent sampling criteria than ISSP. Um, they require a minimum effective sample size of around 1,500, although it's smaller for smaller nations. They only allow random sampling. They don't permit people to carry out any other form of sampling. And they only allow people to carry out the survey face to face. And they're very, very clear about the mode of interview. The interview itself is an hour long interview. Um, so, again, much more depth and detail than is possible with ISSP. Um, and there's extensive attention to translation and a lot of checking as to how countries are translating questions in order to make sure that you really are comparing apples with apples and pairs with pairs. Um, they have a very, very effective data archive system, which is very um, diligent in checking the data that's sent through by countries. And they get the data out there really, really quickly. So we've just released the 2010 data set last month, and we're giving you the science there. In terms of who takes part in ESS, it's um, Eurovision rules rather than a very strict <coughs> excuse me, definition of what counts as Europe. So you have Israel takes place in many rounds. Turkey has taken place in a lot of rounds, but hasn't in the most recent one. Um, in terms of the content of ESS, you can basically see the questionnaire is comprising three different elements. There's a set of core modules that are repeated every single round. Um, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about those in a minute. There's then a much more detailed set of questions which will vary from round to round. And then every round has a very extensive set of background questions, so questions about people's age, household composition, education, and so on. In terms of the core modules here, so these are included each round. 
Um, I've, I've listed some of the most common ones there. Um, and on all of those, you'll have quite a nice time series going back to 2002. In terms of the rotating modules, um, they're, they're probably compared to ISSP, they're a little bit more specific and detailed. Um, they're designed in collaboration with um, what they call question design teams, which are made up of a cross-national panel of experts, either academic or other, who have a specific interest in work in this area. And as you can see, it's quite well-ranging. And um, because ISSP is now um, getting into quite a regular cycle, we're starting to see some sets of questions being repeated. So you can see in 2010, we've got um, work, family, and well-being, which will repeat some of the questions asked in 2004. And there's a real interest there in looking at the economic crisis and the sort of effect that that's had on people's working patterns, well-being, relationships at home, and so on. And then similarly, the next round of ESFest, which is next year, the personal and social well-being module repeats some of the questions that we last asked in 2006. Um, in terms of the data, there's a, I mentioned earlier there's a very effective archive. I'm sure it's more than 27,000 um, registered users now. That was the beginning of this year. And the UK is very well represented in that list of users. So I think we always come out as the second um, second highest number. It's predominantly academic users at the moment, but there's a real interest in trying to increase the use that's made of ESS amongst non-academic non data users, um, international organisations, governments, and so on. So I'm trying to, in my role as the UK coordinator for ESS, I'm trying to do a lot more to promote the data to a wider group. Um, as part of that, it's really worth flagging that if you register with the ESS Data Archive, you can either download the data and then go away and do with it what you wish, or you can carry out quite sophisticated online analyses using um, those of you who used Nestar before. Um, it's, it's that sort of process where you can basically select certain variables, you can look at how they vary across country, you, you can look at how they vary across time. And then finally, I just wanted to mention if anyone's involved in academic teaching, there's a really good resource on the same website called EduNet, which basically uses ESS data to illustrate some of the sort of key theoretical questions within social science at the moment. So for example, social trust and social capital. And it uses ESS data to illustrate how one could get these students to um, analyze international survey data in order to get a better handle on those sorts of issues. Um, so just to finish off, those are some further sources of information about either ISSP or the European Social, so Social Survey. And then I've also included there a really good um, article written by Roger Jowell, who was in fact very involved in setting up both the surveys, but it's a very well-known name within um, cross-national social research. Thank you.